uh, BSD security fundamentals. Um, this is just going to like hopefully at the end of this talk you guys will have a little bit better understanding of some of the security mechanisms that are actually built right into BSD and a lot of people just don't make use of them and they're actually pretty nifty so um, yeah I'm just going to get started. I'm going to throw this presentation up. Uh, you'll have to excuse, excuse my PowerPoint format. It's not very polished. I just throw as much stuff in there so I like remember I don't you know so I don't leave anything out when I'm giving the talk. So um, this will be up on the. This is a little bit different than the one in your CD. It's a uh, couple more revisions to it. So go ahead and uh, the website is going to be subtrain.net/presentations, and you can get some of the other talks that the rest of the guys uh, that I work with have done. So subtrain.net slash presentations okay okay so um, for this whole talk I'm pretty much going to be focusing on FreeBSD um, that's like the main operating system that that uh, my friends and I work with and um, it's really the most mainstream and I mean I'll, I'll like deviate a little bit and talk about some cool stuff with OpenBSD but uh, it's mainly going to be FreeBSD um, it's just going to be it's going to be a refresher I mean you, some of you guys may already know a lot of this stuff but I mean, I'm sure everybody will pick up a, a couple things that they didn't know. They think's pretty cool, um, and it's gonna it's gonna be emphasized on on host-based security. And I'm just gonna basically show you, uh, you, know, you know, using a defense in depth strategy, you're able to secure a BSD server, um, you know, all all the way up to the to the wire, pretty much. And and uh, it's like it's like this, the models of the security onion. You know, what I mean, you peel it away. A lot of people, I mean, it's ridiculous with like the recent Apache chunked encoding stuff. I mean, I'm sure some of you guys uh, came across this, but a lot of people actually went out of their way to start up Apache running as root because you know they need they didn't understand how file permissions work and and symlinks work and and they just wanted Apache to have access to their entire directory structure. So once they got hit by the exploit, they were you know they were toast. So okay, so BSD is actually. Um, in use in quite a few different products um, in today's like computer enterprise world, and it's kind of behind the scenes a lot of times. Um, a lot of companies are kind of turning to open source right now with like the current uh, state of the economy uh, because they don't want to pay the high support costs for licensing Microsoft software or some other commercial variant. And a lot of times, the quality of the software is, as you guys know, usually better. Um, Nokia firewalls uh, that actually they run Checkpoint uh, they use what's called the IPSO operating system which is like a hardened version of FreeBSD 3.2 and uh, they've just went ahead and done some extra like file locking and stuff and they've, they've got some proprietary stuff that they've added it's pretty cool um, and then all the Juniper uh, all the backbone routers and stuff they all run FreeBSD I think it's called Olive is the uh, is the name of the product, but it it's uh, more or less a BSD machine. You can do package add on it and all kinds of stuff. They're pretty cool. And of course, everybody knows you know Yahoo uses free BSD cluster machines to power all their web stuff and their mail stuff. So all right, so let's just get started with the basics. I mean, everybody should know this, but I thought I'd just go over it anyways. Um, you know, if you're if you're me messing with a system that's in a production environment, you know, make backups. Don't, don't do, you know, don't make any changes you're not comfortable with. If you don't know what's going to do, um, go through your inid comp file and rc comp file, and just turn off what you're not using. I mean, FreeBSD is especially has gotten really good lately in the last couple of releases, and um, I think all the way back to like 4.3, uh, they've just turned almost everything off by default in inid, which is like, I mean, they're they're really like setting the pace for other vendors because I mean, up till just like maybe a year ago, the the standard was just you know. Vendors were more concerned about making stuff work out of the box rather than, you know, emphasizing security. So I mean, they would just turn everything on by default to make it easier for the customer, which didn't turn out to be a very good security strategy. Um, if you're running a machine and all you need to do is send mail locally, um, you can actually uh, disable send mail, uh, disable the daemon mode, send mail uh, in the RC comp file with uh, some flags. And you can also turn off the submission port. Uh, send mail comes default with FreeBSD in case some of you guys didn't know that. And the submission port is just another, um, I think it's it's um, new to like send mail, like late versions 8.11 and 8.12. And uh, most mail servers don't make use of it, so you can firewall it off or, or disable it in the RC conf. I'll get into how to do that specifically in a little bit. 
Um, and obviously, I mean, you, you're going to want to track the most stable version of the operating system. Um, if you're working in a production environment, I would say probably rebuild the system and rebuild the kernel like every two months or maybe um, every month and a half. Um, obviously make exceptions. Uh, I know just recently we've had some problems with OpenSSH and um, the, the FreeBSD team got uh, the 3.4 stuff with the privilege separation uh, put into the stable tree pretty quickly after that, even though uh, stable wasn't actually affected by the recent um, off by one and some of the other remote open SSH stuff that's been floating around. Um, if you're, I mean, if you're a hobbyist, you know, I'd say go for it as, m as much as possible. I, I think I could probably count on one hand in the past three or four years the times that I've seen the stable tree really broken to the point where you couldn't, you know, kind of figure out what was wrong or if maybe somebody just made a, made a fat finger or something when they did their commit and, it, you know, it got taken care of, you know, within 30 minutes or an hour or so. Um, I think that. I'm not sure about this. I'm not sure if they've if they've gotten um, gotten rid of this, but there's another branch called the security branch, um, and basically, that's like a an option for you if you you're running a production system and you don't want to, um, you don't think stable is really stable, basically, but you want all the security fixes, and all they do is commit anything like the uh, the recent like IO smash stuff. They just commit patches to that, and then you, all you that's all you get. And a lot of people prefer that if they're looking to run a really stable environment. Um, and there's the, there's the recent open SSL stuff that I was checking out before I head out to head out to Black Hat this week. But uh, it looks like um, there have been five or six new vulnerabilities found in open SSL. So rebuild your systems when you get home. Okay, encrypted communications. I mean, especially at DEF CON, I was really amazed the amount of people that were still like popping their mail and everything at like DEF CON 10. It's kind of ridiculous, but <laughs> um, more or less, I don't think there's a, there's an excuse to not encrypt stuff that you're doing um, between SSH tunnels or using S tunnel to wrap stuff uh, with SSL. I mean, what, I mean, what's your excuse for not doing that? You know, and Open SSH has been included in the uh, FreeBSD base since. Um, I think FreeBSD 4.0. Um, a lot of people have chosen to track the port, though, and use port upgrade to just keep it current. Um, and you can actually, there's an RCCOM variable, the, I think it's sshd underscore uh, daemon, and you can just specify the path to your ssh uh, daemon, so you can you can put it wherever you want. Um, personally, I, I just stick with what's in stable. I, didn't, I never had a problem with it. Um, even if with some of the the recent open SSH disclosures, uh, people were kind of muddy as to as to what was affected, where, and under what circumstances. So I mean, I just recommend going through and upgrading all your systems to uh, 3.4 uh, and disabling SSH version one uh, where you can on some older systems, um, especially some legacy stuff. Uh, like I know, like PIX firewalls and stuff, they only listen on uh, to SSH uh, version one for the protocol. Uh, so I mean that might be a problem, but on on your BSD systems you really, you know, have no no excuse not to. And you can turn on privilege separation. It's not enabled uh, by default with 3.4. Uh, you have to go in there and turn it on. It's an option in the SSHD config file. And it's just like I think it's enable or use privilege separation. And uh, basically that'll just fork off a process when somebody uh, authenticates to your machine successfully, and it'll drop some privileges. Um, I'll get into that a little bit later as to how some of that stuff works. Um, SFTP, this is kind of recent. I think it's like OpenSSH 2.9 uh, brought it in to the tree like as a standard thing, but uh, it's just basically a um, way to uh, use you know connect to your system to transfer files over SSH. Um, and obviously, I mean, the problems with FTP, everybody knows. Uh, some of you guys may have caught uh, Jay Beal's talk yesterday. About uh, hardening FTP. Um, the, I mean, the FTP is is 20 years old and you know passes stuff in the clear and uses on an unauthenticated channel for data and everything. It's just it, this this way it's encrypted. Um, this has full like uh, public key support. So I mean, you, you know, you can, it's basically just like you're making a administrative connection into the machine. And uh, there's some neat clients for Windows uh, like SecureFX and I'm not sure if Putty has a file transfer uh, client or not, but it's just it's a lot more secure than using uh, using regular FTP. Okay, uh, public key authentication. Just talking about this a little bit. Um, really, what's going to get you 
I mean, most people are pretty good, like, keeping their systems patched um, that are in the security industry. And, you know, they're, or they're a security engineer at their company or what have you. I mean, they understand the importance of, of rolling patches out in a timely manner. But what's going to get you are your users, usually with weak passwords. And so I'm going to talk quite a bit about how to secure your user accounts. Um, and what it, what it comes down to is, you know, users don't really give a crap about security. And that's just that's just the way it is. I don't I don't know if that'll ever change because I mean people want convenience and they want to be able to use their system and and security and um, security and convenience are just kind of like opposites. So um, I'm going to talk about uh, public key authentication. And I'm going to heavily recommend um, switching all users to public key authentication if your users are savvy enough to handle it. Uh, you know, you may have to have them set up, help them set up the, the public private key pair and everything, but once you do it, uh, you can actually star out their password fields in the password database, and uh, you know, they won't be able to log in with, with a Unix password scheme anymore. Um, if you can't do that, I've got some alternatives later in the talk that I'll, I'll get into. Okay, so I'm just gonna get started, like, f as you're installing, like, you know, you're setting up a new machine or whatever. Um, it's always good to consider security right as you're as you're building the system and and your how your partition scheme looks is is really important to that. Um, as much as you can break it up into different partitions. So at the minimum here, I've got like a root partition, user var temp uh, as a minimum. Uh, slash home should definitely be considered as a separate partition, uh, just because it, it. I mean, depending on the the level of of security you're looking for on your BSD machine, uh, with, with some of the mount options and and, uh, and some of the other stuff you can do, you can really uh, restrict what users can and can't do uh, on the file system. Um, so, like anything except user or slash, because of uh, that's been, uh, you can mount those with a no suit argument, and basically that's just gonna if there's a file with a suit uh, bit set on it it won't execute with that uh, flag pass through mount. And I would also recommend setting that on your home partition too, uh, just because you know users, if they're messing around with something and, and it's sued, especially if it's sued root, you, know, you, don't, you don't really know what they're doing. Um, go through your file system and remove sued bits. I was looking through the FreeBSD um, handbook just to see what the, the project's uh, stance was on this, and they say, you know, anything that's set uh, suet in the in the default installation is probably pretty safe. But if you're not using stuff, um, for example, if uh, any of the UUCP stuff, I mean, you can actually strip that right out in your make.conf file. You can just say don't build UUCP because, you know, who uses that anymore? Um, but just go through your file system uh, and, and look for uh, suet and SGID files and just get rid of those, uh, anything you don't use. Uh, either just remove the bit or uh, just set the file 000, zero, zero so nobody, if nobody's using it. Um, the CH flag stuff, I'm going to get into that uh, right now and in the next couple slides. Uh, like extended, most people actually don't really know about this. It was kind of interesting to me that, that most people didn't find out about this, but um, this is like other variables you can set on a file that uh, when you, you're using kernel secure levels, you can like restrict access to the file. Uh, a couple of the ones I've got here are like um, the S append, like a log file. That'd be like a log file or a text file type of a thing where you've got data incrementing to the to the file, but you don't want anything else. You know, anything else? You don't want someone going in there and, and erasing their tracks or something. So all they can do is append data. All the file system will let them do is append data. You can't do anything else. And the SCHG bit uh, you can set on binaries, system binaries. Um, and that'll basically, that'll just prevent modification, overwriting, deleting, and uh, as long as you're running in a secure level of one or higher, uh, not even root can modify that, so it kind of makes it a pain if you're rebuilding your system because you have to reboot into a non-secure mode and then clear all those, or you know, rebuild your system or whatever, overwrite the binaries, and then reset all the, very, uh, the flags to whatever you had before. So, I mean, it depends on the amount of, depends on the amount of time that you want to spend uh, configuring this stuff. If you get really granular, the only, the, actually, the interesting thing I ran into was 
people were complaining that you know if you set your whole like SBIN and bin directories with the SCHG flag, you couldn't tell if somebody had broken into your system because they weren't able to modify data. People were getting pissed off because they weren't getting any tripwire reports because nobody could modify the files. Thanks. <laughs> okay, so kernel secure levels. Um, basically, you can change these. These are variables you can change on the fly. You can't. Um, you can't lower them though. When once the system is in multi-user mode, the only real fault with kernel secure levels is that it doesn't. The the secure level doesn't get set until very late in the boot process. So. If you like, if you're kind of paranoid about that, and and you think maybe one of your startup scripts has been modified, and and somebody's doing something nasty before your your secure level gets raised, um, it's always best to like set that SCHG uh, bit on your your RC files or some of your other startup files to prevent modification of those. Um, so the levels go from negative one to three. A negative one and zero are kind of the same thing; they're just in secure mode. And uh, secure level one. Is you know the, you can set like the append and the SCHG flags, uh, and you can, you can't disable them once they're set, and you can't load any LKMs, uh, load kernel modules. You can't load or unload those uh, in Secure Level One. Uh, secure Level Two is the same thing, but you can't write to disks uh, in a raw fashion except for mount, and also uh, time changes. Uh, any any changes to the system clock are, are clamped to plus or minus one second change. So if you're running like a, a PC or something with a doesn't keep time very well, you know, when you reboot your system to drop it into uh, secure level zero to rebuild your system, you're gonna want to go ahead and set your clock then because if you don't it'll you'll just get errors in your in your log files about the time changes clamped to one second. Okay, so yeah we just we talked about that setting the, the ICHG flag on on some of the uh, your system binary directories. Okay, this is a lot of data, I know. And uh, if you can't read it, that's cool. Uh, just grab the. This is all in the on the CD, and this is going to be up on the website too. Uh, basically, uh, there's sysctl variables. Uh, that's also uh, the the secure level configurations for FreeBSD is a sysctl variable, and um, it's just a numerical value, negative one to three. But these are some other settings that um, a lot of people don't really know about. Uh, that can actually kind of help you strengthen your your network stack a little bit and uh, kind of keep people guessing as to what you're running, and it kind of pisses people off that are trying to port scan you. Um, the the TCP black hole variable is the first one I'll talk about, and you can set that to zero, one, or two. Um, basically, I'm I'm just going to recommend two in almost any case, uh, which is a totally silent mode where it's just not going to generate reset packets back to the source on any connection attempts uh, to a port that has you know no socket open nothing listening so if somebody throws a port scan at you that opens up ports 0 through 10,000 you know you've got like three things running on this, those 10,000 ports they're just going to get you're just going to sit there and they're in timeout they're just going to be waiting for a reset packet back to see if if your port is closed or not and um, there's the same uh, setting for UDP and basically, that's the same same procedure, same idea, except that uh, it won't generate an ICMP port unreachable message uh, on a port with no socket listening. So same thing. Uh, that will break trace route to your system. So if you care about people being able to trace route to you, you may want to drop that to to zero or disable it. But so here's some other uh, RC conf settings that you can do. This is how you turn on secure levels. Uh, in, in the main RC comp file, you have to enable it, specify enable it, and then set the number that you want. Uh, secure level three is the same thing as secure level two, except you can't modify IPFW rules, which can kind of be a pain if you're initially building your system or something, or you're, you're adding services, because you have to bounce the machine if you want to make any changes to your firewall rule base. So that's just maybe something you want to keep in mind as you're setting that up. Uh, ICMP drop redirect. This is going to drop any uh, redirect packets from. Supposedly, they're, they're supposed to come from a router, but it's gonna, just going to drop them from anywhere, and it's just going to prevent people from modifying the path that uh, that your traffic is taking. And then there's the the TCP drop synfin, and that's just going to drop any packets uh, with the syn and the fin bit, bit sets. And it, it does break an RFC technically. 
it's not ROC compliant, but you know, it, there's no legitimate use for traffic with both of those bits set at the same time. So, you know, I, I would recommend enabling it anyways. Clear temp enable is kind of cool. Uh, it'll just go through and, and wipe stuff in your temp directory uh, on reboot. And one other one, I don't know if I put it in here later or not, is uh, fsck underscore y underscore enable equals yes. It's a really handy setting if your machine is co-located or something and, and you don't have physical access to it. If your machine gets bounced or, or if, if it crashes or something and it comes back up and uh, starts up fsck to, to check out your file systems, this will just automatically you know, accept any changes that FSCK is going to make, so you won't have to call somebody up and go, hey, go over to the console and press YYY a few times. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, it's FSCK underscore Y underscore enable equals yes. Go ahead. Um, you can I've I've heard of people compiling like the riser fs stuff under BSD but that's all like I've got a friend of mine uh, in the UK that works on the current stuff a lot and he's he's really into like the cutting edge stuff um, I've heard that they're thinking of integrating journaling stuff into UFS uh, for 50 but I have I haven't confirmed that yet so not by not by default I don't think go ahead Well, yeah, soft. It's kind of a. It's a philosophical. This guy pointed out soft updates is um, is an option that you can set on your file systems. Soft updates is kind of interesting um, in the way that it writes to the disk. Sometimes it won't actually write changes to the disk for up to a minute, and so it's it's kind of a a trade off if you want to enable that or not. If you're doing a lot like heavy disk intensive stuff, FreeBSD recommends you turn on soft updates, and and I think it actually turns it on by default when you set up a partition. Where does it store what? Those are those. He he says where are the where are the updates stored? They're they're in memory, and they're just waiting to be written to the disk. Right. If your machine crashes, your SOL for whatever data was written up to a minute or prior to a minute. Okay. Um, the I mean the the two kind of like duh parts of this talk are are. Um, encrypting your traffic and starting services in a jail environment. I mean so many services that you're going to see run nowadays have either native support for a jail like uh, Bind or Apache or you can actually you can use this jail functionality built into FreeBSD. You can build a separate jail for for any service that you're running pretty much and I mean you can lock that down to a specific part of the file system and restrict people and uh, I mean by default I mean, and SSH is kind of the newest one to do this with the privilege separation and kind of and, and fork off a separate process for each user. Um, but by default, I think that probably services like Bind and I, Apache's already done this, where when you do a FreeBSD install, um, you're going to get the the www user, and um, I think the Apache ports tree is updated now, where the default um, username and group name that Apache runs under is www. So, I mean, people have been using Nobody for a while, but People didn't really understand that if you use nobody and you run four or five different services as nobody, it's not an unprivileged user anymore. So, I mean, you, you definitely need to break it out into separate users. Um, and with SSH, they've also they've added an SSH uh, user, and the the jail f uh, for that is uh, slash var slash empty. Okay, for for log in vain. Uh, this is this is kind of like this will pop up in your your D message, and you can configure this to drop into your messages file uh, through syslog. Uh, this is just going to show any connections to your machine on ports that aren't listening. Uh, so obviously this is going to sort of conflict with uh, some of the black hole stuff that I was talking about a few slides back. But if if you set this, um, you you know you're quickly going to tell if somebody's port scanning you or something. You're going to see a bunch of connections on on ports that you aren't even listening on. So uh, this is, and it's definitely uh, a lot of people kind of mistake this this uh, this RC conf variable for um, like some kind of packet filtering stuff. It's not that all it does is report people connecting on on ports that you're not using. So you know, use it in conjunction with a nice IPF or IPFW rule set. Okay, so 
the next the next thing is is using IPF on on almost any system and and a lot of people take the the mindset that you know they're they're behind their fire their corporate firewall you know they're inside their 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 office network you know nobody really malicious is doing anything but even if it's just you know your laptop or something I mean it can't hurt to throw a nice IPFW rule set on your laptop and and keep people out I'm sure a lot of people had that payoff at DEF CON this year you know I mean it, and it's it's really easy if you go to uh, if you look at in the ETC directory, there's an RC firewall um, file, and I think I get into that later on. But I can't want to get ahead. Of, oh, go ahead. He, he says, "What's the the performance impact on a a, a couple dozen rule set IPFW uh, setup on a busy system? It depends what you define as a busy system." And it depends how fast your link speed is, and it depends on the specs of the machine. Uh, personally, I've seen a, a machine take um, like 80 or 90 megabits of traffic that it was filtering, and it was like a it was like a one gigahertz Pentium three or something. And the, you could tell that the load is noticeable. I don't really have any measurable data to give you, but I would say probably like a, a 20 or 30 percent impact. But that's that's with the full out. 80 megabit right ac right across a, a fast Ethernet link. Uh, it was dropping every single packet. So, okay. Um, a lot of people have have kind of they say you know it's I'd like SFTP and everything, but I'm either I'm running an anonymous file archive or I've got users who need FTP. They don't want to learn a new client, even though it's kind of transparent as to the differences. You know, they have some old scripts or something that are using FTP that they can convert. Whatever reason, um, I would not recommend using FTP really anymore unless you're running an anonymous archive. And I'll kind of show you how to how to lock it down. But uh, you know, if if you've got any users logging in individually. Uh, put their put their username in the uh, etc ftp ch root file, and that's just going to basically restrict them to their home directory. Um, by default, they're not going to be restricted. They're going to just be able to move all all around the file system. And so, if you've been kind of lax with your file permissions somewhere else, uh, you know they may have access to something that you don't want them to have access to. Uh, if you start FTP uh, from inetd, you can go in uh, and stick all some of these flags. Uh, right at the, right at the end, uh, dash l twice will enable extended logging, and then you actually have to turn on logging for the FTP facility in syslog. Uh, that's that's going to give you each uh, connection, uh, each user's connecting, you know, time and, and date, and also any files that they're uploading or downloading. And so the files can get kind of verbose. It's kind of similar to the X for log functionality in Linux. And so if you're running an anonymous archive. Uh, use like capital dash A and um, dash R, and uh, capital A is only going to allow anonymous connections, nothing else, which is handy because nobody's going to figure out that they can FTP into your machine when you really don't want them to, even though they're a legitimate user. And dash R is read-only mode, where uh, the daemon will actually restrict itself from making any write calls to the system at all. So in the event that somebody figures out how to Overflow your because FT FTPD runs as root. So, you know, if, if somebody figures out how to overflow that, it's not going to be able to write anything to the machine. Okay, logging is obviously very important. Uh, keeping track of your system. And before I get into any of this, I, you know, obviously logging, you have to spend the time looking at your logs on your system so you know what's routine and you know what's not routine. Because if you see something out of the ordinary that kind of looks out of the ordinary just because you say that's not really right if you don't have like data to back that up you know say i haven't i haven't seen something like that in a month or something or i've never seen that before that's going to be a lot you know more of a clue into you that hey something something funny is going on uh if you start if you're running like a, a regular workstation i i would recommend this start syslog for, with the dash ss flags and that's just going to prevent the, the daemon from opening uh the udp port 514 uh by default freebsd won't let any users connect to your syslog daemon to log, and a lot of operating systems didn't used to do that, and so people could, you know, fill up your logs or at the very at the very worst, fill up your whole file system if you didn't have permission set up right. Uh, someone would just allow unauthenticated connections from anywhere. Um, 
this is just gonna this is gonna keep anybody from being able to connect to your syslog D at all. Um, I would recommend setting up a centralized syslog file, especially if you're running an enterprise uh, and you've got you know 10 or 20 different servers. Maybe uh, it's much easier to send all the data to a central place and then you know maybe even, even pull the data into some kind of a, uh, you know an Excel spreadsheet or something for quick quick sorting or a database. Uh, this is the the syntax to do it. You just this is. Um, the wild card right here is just saying log anything on any uh, any facility to remotehost.org, and you can obviously fill that in with a local IP address or something. Uh, you will not be able to use this dash ss thing up here though. With this the machine that you're sending the logs to, obviously it needs to have that that port open to be able to accept the logs. Um, in the in your syslog conf file, add this uh, var log ftpd or whatever you want to call it if you're running an FTP server, so that you can. You know, you, you get more information about what's going on with FTP. I, I think by default it doesn't log anything that's going on with FTP at all, or maybe it drops it into messages, which is kind of kludgy because there's so much other stuff going on in that file. It's kind of hard to keep track. Um, the security file, IPFW uses the security facility, and so do a few other applications. But um, at the end of your your IPFW rule base, drop like a you know. If, because it'll just do it. It just goes down the rule base, and if a packet doesn't match, it'll drop to the next rule. At the end, put it like a log any rule, and anything that didn't match any of your uh, your other packets is going to go ahead and, and get dropped into that file. Um, there's a there's a I, I'm sure most of you guys have heard of this. There's a, a dshield.org project, and they have a client framework for IPFW logs and it's like it's just a Perl script that goes through and parses it out and changes the data into uh, the D shield compatible data and then you can set up a, a cron script or something to to email that data every night or something uh, you know people connecting to your machine uh, and then you can go and log in through the web and take a look at it and you can coordinate it with other people other people submit their logs all around the world it's pretty cool Yeah. Right. Uh -huh. Yeah, and and uh, what he said the the FTP users file you can drop users in there that you don't want to be able to use FTP at all, and so obviously you're going to want to drop like root and and obviously any privileged user you, know, you don't want them passing their password in clear text, and that's 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 a good. Add on to, to the rest of the FTP stuff, the FTP CH root, and everything else. Um, some of this stuff is kind of interesting. This isn't uh, this isn't default with BSD, but uh, I ran across a couple of these projects just doing a little bit of research. Uh, Trojanproof.org. Um, they actually have a really cool white paper on their webpage about how they developed uh, this tool. But uh, I think they started with OpenBSD and they moved to FreeBSD for development. And it's kind of like it's almost like Tripwire, uh, but in the kernel, and it can tell you if there are any uh, MD5 variations if something's changed uh, with files that are executing on your system. So as they are executing, it goes ahead and, and does the hash on the file to see if it's changed. And it it uh, they have some performance specs because a lot of people were concerned about performance on a on a you know an enterprise machine, obviously. And and I think to benchmark it, they like built the kernel with. Uh, this enabled in the kernel and then this without and I think there's like a 12 second difference or, or a 2 second difference I can't remember which but it really wasn't that bad and so that kind of works well with, with another file integrity tool like Tripwire um, and that's just going to that's just going to give you the the kernel level uh, MD5 checking and, and go ahead and check out the, the website they've got they can explain it much better than I can as far as if you're interested in the specifics of how it works uh, the next one is is server.sf.net. Uh, this does like system call interception and logging of uh, any what you might deem potentially dangerous system calls. So uh, I've got a few listed here: exec ve, ptrace, set uid. You can configure every single one of these uh, through sysctl commands. So you can say, you know, I think that that uh, set UID call is really dangerous alert or, and block it or you could say I think ptrace I just want to log any of that um, or I don't want to do anything with exec v for example so I mean you can configure it to whatever settings you want and 
Um, the author actually has some some recommended settings if you're not really sure what's what. You really kind of have to tweak it for your environment to see you know what what your system is using. And um, there's a uh, there's a tool called SysTrace that was actually written for OpenBSD and um, a guy at Black Hat this, this week showed that he, he ported it to FreeBSD. And what SysTrace does is it'll basically log system calls that are being used by a, a particular process and then um, block ones that are not in what's called like a rules file for it. So you initially set it up and you run it with uh, like a wrapper, like a TCP wrapper. Uh, so you execute SysTrace and then I think it's like dash A and then the, the daemon. And it'll start up and it'll log the syscalls that it uses. So you can go through, go ahead and put it through its paces. We'll say for SSH, you log in, you know, do an SCP, copy a file over or whatever, and then uh, it'll it'll drop all that stuff into a text file. It's like a rules file, and then you can say, okay, that's everything that it can do. Don't let it do anything else. And so, you know, if if you attempt like an off by one exploit or something on your SSH daemon, uh, it's gonna if it uses a system call that isn't used by SSH legitimately, it's gonna it's just going to drop it, so that's kind of nifty. Um, BPF in your kernel is is enabled by default. Uh, I think it's you only allowed two concurrent BPF filters uh, in the generic kernel. But uh, if you're running a production machine, you have no need uh, for promiscuous mode or any kind of uh, uh, real raw packet sniffing type stuff on your your system. You should probably turn this off. Um, can, if you do this in conjunction with setting the secure levels on your machine, so uh, an intruder couldn't load a kernel module or something to uh, to make a change, uh, that's just going to prevent people from from sniffing on your wire. And another thing you, that you may want to do is is uh, write a script to check your D message output to see if anyone's put your interface into promiscuous mode and you don't know about it. So you could use like Swatch or something to monitor the logs and send you an email. But I mean, BPF is used by other things. Uh, any kind of like some like real raw IP stuff may use it. So you probably want to test it out on a, a non-production system before you do that on on anything that that's production. Okay. This part's called keeping people out, and it's it's some of it's pretty basic, but uh, a lot of people don't really use TCP wrappers that, the, and they should for. For non-public services, for like SSH authentication, um, stuff that people aren't connecting to anonymous, honestly, for example, like people sending you email connecting to your SMTP server or, or you know, browsing the you know the, your website or whatever. I mean, you can't do you can't use TCP wrappers with that stuff, obviously, because you don't know who's coming. But uh, for SSH and FTP, if you you know you've only got a select group of people using FTP, I mean, the more you lock it down, the better you're off. And and so like TCP wrappers combined with a nice uh, IPFW rule set is just going to give you that defense in depth, and you know you never know when it can pay off. So the next one is, is allow users and allow groups um, arguments in, in a, the SSHD config file. You can specify certain users or certain groups, respectively, that are allowed to connect to SSH uh, using SSH. So if you know you've got a user who's an FTP user and you need to give them a shell for some reason, but you don't want them to come in through SSH, you know, you'd obviously use this to not allow them, uh, I think it's, it's disallow users to not allow. Uh, you probably want to double check that. Uh, so go ahead, this works well with, with TCP wrapper usage and, and privilege separation in open SSH. And this, this last one is give users, uh, people that are, are only FTPing to the machine, give them a no login shell. Obviously people have been doing that for years, that's pretty basic. So th these are some tools that you can use to, to check your system, and, and if you don't know what M MF is, you're, you're probably in the wrong building. <laughs> uh, Whisker is, is pretty cool. There's a new uh, Whisker version 2 that RFP is developing, that's the author, and, and uh, it's a little more modular. So his, his website is wiretrip.net. Uh, you may want to check that out, but the one in the ports tree is, is uh, Whisker 1.4, which is you know, it works okay for, for auditing real basic stuff. Uh, you know, if, if you've got an old PHF vulnerability on your network or something. Uh, Tripwire. Uh, Tripwire is a commercial entity now, but the, what's called the academic source release of Tripwire is still available for free use. Uh, and all you have to do is go in the ports tree and build it. And you actually have to go get the source yourself. It doesn't use the traditional dis files uh, ports distribution method just because of the way the licensing works. Uh, but you can, I mean, Tripwire, you know, install it on your system. 
uh, generate the database and then keep the database on a, a floppy disk or something and, and go through and just verify that you know anything that's been changed you know you know about and that can give you real peace of mind as far as as what's going on on your system but it, again it's only as granular as, as how you make it and how many files you have it check and if you have it look at everything you're going to drive yourself crazy just because the amount of file changes that get take place that you know you don't really realize and snort um, a lot of people are using snort on their they're just their host machines now because it's a lot easier than you know kind of doing the combined like log analysis of everything and looking at some of the other uh, you know your, your firewall logs and everything else with snort I mean if something trips a signature you're kind of interested in, in what's going on go ahead Yeah, actually, um, he asks, can I use Snort for any kind of a defensive mechanism? And uh, there's a tool called Hogwash, and the uh, address for it is uh, hogwash.sourceforge.net. And uh, it's written or co-written by one of the Snort developers. And uh, it's actually being integrated into the Snort CVS tree right now for Snort 1.9. It's going to be called inline Snort. It's just going to be a compile time option. But basically, instead of like an alert, you know, you write a snort rule instead of the alert variable to like you know alert and, and write to a file or something. You can do drops, and so for a TCP connection, it'll send a reset back as soon as it realizes that the the packet matches the payload for say like a code red attack or something. Uh, and it also has content replacement. So you know, going back to code red, you could say replace cmd.exe with xyz.com, or replace the first you know. Four or five bytes of the of a shellcode slide or something with with nulls and those you know even if even if your uh, your system isn't patched you're still going to be protected to an extent because you're just basically screwing up the exploit and and it kind of it kind of confuses the attacker because if they're sending like a cmd.exe request they're just going to get back you know a 404 or something and because their request is being modified halfway through so it it, it can. Uh, it, and that's kind of a, a mixed blessing because if they really get clever and they start going, well, hey, how, what's going on? I know that I was able to get to that, you know, two days ago or something. They start digging in deeper. They may be able to figure out that you're running something like hogwash on your network. But a lot of people are actually deploying that outside their firewall to grab stuff uh, before it, it hits their DMZ, and it's pretty effective. Go ahead. Right. Yeah, you just mentioned AID is another file integrity tool. I per right. Um, I really like Tripwire. I like the signature syntax. It's really flexible and, and it's pretty easy to, to write some pretty custom rules really fast. Okay, just some miscellaneous stuff. Um, you should throw these on all your machines. Like, throw you know, use NTP date. Uh, cron tab it and have it sync time with you know an internal time server or something out on the internet so you, you know your logs are always in sync and up to date uh, I know well, some of this stuff seems basic but a lot of people don't do it in the TTYs file uh, change the secure flag to insecure on all your local uh, TTYs and that's just basically going to prevent root from logging in directly so you're just going to have to force somebody to log in as themselves and then like su to root or use sudo or something uh, and also, in SSHD config, there's a permit root login, and I think by default it's yes. So obviously, you know, change that to no. You don't want people logging into your system as root. I mean, never, whenever possible, don't use the root password for some kind of authentication. At, at the, the very most, use it, you know, su to root or something. But if you can, use sudo, because it's you're just gonna be able to restrict the who knows the root password on your system and you can granularly lock down you know who can do what on your machine and they don't need the root password uh... the last one is a, is a kernel configuration that you can do uh... it's a pseudo device that you can enable called the SNP, SNP device and uh... you can go ahead and, and and use that i think the tool is called watch uh... in, in the user spin directory and you can attach to a TTY on your machine, and it's non-interactive. You can't type back, but you can watch what somebody's doing, and you can you can monitor them as they're uh, as they're going along. 
Okay, so, so here's some, some related stuff. Uh, here's the link that the, this presentation is going to be available at uh, with some of the updated info. Uh, and freebsd.org slash security, I mean, you definitely want to bookmark that and, and, and check that out pretty often because uh, that's where they post all the security advisories and they also... Uh, there's like a security how-to that was, it's kind of outdated, it was written a few years ago, but it's got some good info. Um, and I've got some free stuff for you guys uh, from the FreeBSD mall guys. Um, I, I think I've almost got enough for every single person in here. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, Murray, Murray, the guy who runs FreeBSD mall, heard I was going to be talking about FreeBSD, and so we were talking. And, um, if you guys want to come up, I've got, uh, well, actually, hang on, let me do t-shirts first. Don't move. I've got to give my plug first. These are, these are made by my friend Tim, and he works for a company called HacksorWear.com, and nobody else has these t-shirts. These are all like zero days. So. what happens when you resist arrest. Very good, sir. You must be a cop. Next year, folks, spot the fed. But we're out of shirts, so...